All right. Welcome back to the Outdoor Drive Podcast. Thanks for joining in with us this week on the Outdoor Drive Podcast. We really appreciate it for everybody out there listening. We just want to thank you guys. And also, if you guys haven't already, make sure to give us a five-star review on the iTunes. Or if you're listening in on YouTube, please go on over, hit the notification bell, the subscribe button, so on and so forth. And uh, really looking forward to this podcast, a little bit different. We're going to kind of bring it back and kind of leave the land as sometimes we do and kind of get out on the boat. So this is your boy, East Coast Trev. And this is Steve. Just Steve. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Never changes, man. No, I'm, that's that's one thing about you. you. We definitely know when you're here. It's the consistent. same. Very consistent. Consistent is key. That's it, man. You, you get the same thing every time. There's no BS in the underlying here. It's, I consistently bring you to Virginia and give you a hard time, and we have a hard time getting in. It's consistent. That's right. <laughs> Listen, you know, that's that's what I've always said, you know, like in high school and stuff is that, you know, if if I give you if if I go above and beyond, then it's expected. Right. So if I do have some a good day, then you're like you're so happy to have it. Right. So it's just like it's like Virginia. If if we have a good time, we, that's a normal thing. If we kill a deer, then it's extraordinary. Right. So we just keep going. Yeah, well, that's the thing. If I come, if I tell you, hey, come down here, it's going to be tough. It's going to suck. It's going to be hard. We have low chances. You get down here, and if we have a good day, hey, I look like a superstar. <laughs> that's right. That's, there's nothing so. better than that. Some men do that, too, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Moving I had on. To, it just kind of fit. It kind of yeah, fit it, to it, where it was, right? <laughs> it was. I set you up. I set you up. Well, man, what have you been up to since we've left left there? Uh, work and video and work. I mean, I think we came out of last week with a little over seven and a half hours of footage that I've got to pile through and get set up so we can get these videos up on YouTube and try to make a, a halfway good production out of it. So nothing wrong with that, man. And And not only that, we also already have by this time, we have Kim's hunt up. And then portions of our Virginia hunt up on there. So if you guys haven't already, get on over to the YouTube page and uh, give that a give a give that thing a like and a comment. Tell us how much we love it. We did try something a little bit different. Steve came up with a great idea of doing an interview style with Kim's hunt. So it was kind of cool. We got to sit in studio and go over the hunt play by play with Kim, uh, all live right there in uh in virginia so then she kind of took us through her paces of her uh kill there in virginia and steve kind of uh put in the uh the hunt so it was it was a, i like that dynamic man it was actually a really cool thing and it was cool to watch and listen to kim actually tell the story it really put you put you right there like you know we're sitting there in the blind together yeah it's something that i think we're gonna continue to do when we hunt together I, I yeah. just really liked the dynamic and the way everything worked out just was fun. I enjoyed it. It was a little different and uh, could be our our mark on the, the way things we do video and just go for there. Yeah, man. I, I think it's I think it's definitely a really cool thing and I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. We got a couple of hunts planned together and I think it'll be fun to kind of do it that way, you know, kind of take people through the paces and then they can hear our, our crappy voices in the background kind of telling them what happened. <laughs> Well, the biggest thing for everyone listening, please get on YouTube, subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification button. That's really going to help us with the algorithm. And we need to hit a thousand viewers in the next year. It's very important. Uh, a thousand us. subscriptions, I should say. Sorry. Uh, that will really help launch the platform. So I'm asking you guys, if you can go in there, I don't care if you, you don't do YouTube or any of that. Just, just get on YouTube and hit the subscribe button and walk away. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're like a quarter to half the way there. So you guys will really make a difference for us. We really appreciate it. Even if you don't listen to the podcast there, or, you know, you want to check out a video or two. And, and one thing that we're going to do here on the podcast, and I'll kind of give you guys a little sneak peek to it. I mean, what better time than now? Um, we're actually going to rebrand and reface the podcast by the beginning of deer season. Um, it's, it's one of our goals here to do such a thing. And we're going to do a lot more on YouTube. We're going to do a lot more with video um, as we have been, but just kind of take the paces and kind of move forward with it as far as 
you know, all of our hunts on there and kind of do more weekly stuff or than than yearly stuff and just constantly have some type of content dropping on there as far as video. I know when you guys that do do the notifications on there, you guys see it and then it's a podcast. It's a podcast, but we kind of want to do something a little bit different and kind of bring it into, you know, refacing it and and doing something with the podcast um, video side of kind of like keeping us on what we're actually doing. Definitely. And, and with, a, it'll be a big shift. Yeah, it's going to be an absolute huge shift because with that, you guys will also notice that we are kind of toning back our wild side. We're no longer the college frat boys that are drinking all the time and swearing and cussing. We're kind of going to be going down the professional way. We're, um, we're going to actually sound like we know what we're doing. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's time to do that because now this will be season two together, um, hunting and so on and so forth. And we, you know, if you go back and you listen to a lot of other people's podcasts, like Steven had said, you know, they kind of, they get to that point. And I think that we've molded to that point where we have to step up the paces and go to the next thing. So that's what we're going to do. I don't want to bore you guys with stupid crap, but I just a little sneak preek of what we got going on. Yeah. Just reality check. And if we want this to grow, we got to grow with it. So we'll take what we're doing and we'll make it better. We're at that point. So, but keep, keep, keep paying attention to what we got going on. Um, and don't forget also is our ducks on the bay, uh, giveaway hunt. That's going to run here for a little bit longer. Um, we are giving away a sea duck hunt here in the Northeast, um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. So all you got to do is you got to go over to either ducks on the bay, Northeaster game calls, wicked twisted bowstrings, um, broadside camo, gator outdoors, timber tumblers out on the limb. Um, and if, They have a promo code. Use the promo code. And if not, in the notes, go and just write uh, Outdoor Drive Giveaway. And that will get you uh, a slot in our giveaway. And uh, if you are to buy a hat that we have, because I do have some of those coming up soon. I have two dozen hats coming, uh, two different colors. And then also, if you go to Ducks on the Bay and buy something from them that gets you two entries. And if you buy from us, obviously it's two entries also and everything else is one entry. So you could get into this very cheaply. If you go to ducks on and you buy their sticker pack, it's three stickers for $5 you could get and buy yourself uh, into this trip. So it'd be pretty simple. And all of our giveaway instructions are on our social media platforms and they also are on our website. So get on over to the sponsors and we thank those guys for working with us. And uh, yeah, pretty simple. Pretty easy. Pretty cool giveaway. You get to come and hunt with me in the Northeast. Can't complain about that at all. No, it'll be a horrible time. Absolutely horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we'll go with that. Yep. So, well, man, I think I hear something coming in. Do you hear that? I I do. It's time we return to some of the norm, and uh, I think I'm going to have you crank that bad boy up. All right, let me get on that. Hey everyone, Mike here with some news for your cruise. Uh, we're going to keep this one centered in New England. We're going to start it off in Connecticut, uh, where the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's Fishery Division uh, Care Program is looking to help those new to fishing or anyone interested in starting to fish. They are offering introduction to fishing Zoom classes and fishing field trips. Uh, to take part in those, first you will need to go through Deep's Fishing webpage and register for one of the Intro to Fishing Zoom classes, uh, which those are held weekly. Uh, Once that is completed, you can attend any of Deep's free special fishing events uh, held three times a week. These started in mid-April, but they will run through the end of May, so you do still have some time left uh, if you want to participate in any of those. Uh, Care fishing instructors will be on hand at those events with loaner equipment. Uh, bait and to provide instruction for all attendees. Uh, Those events are limited to 35 people per event uh, and pre-registration through Deep's Fishing webpage is recommended. So if anyone's interested, if you're having trouble, you know, finding the links or anything on their web pages, shoot me a message and I'll send those directly to you. Uh, So now let's go to Vermont uh, where the Fish and Wildlife Department is also engaging in some how to fish clinics this spring. Uh, These clinics are free and open to all ages and experience levels, uh, including those who are completely new to fishing. There are two classes scheduled for intro to bullhead fishing, 
Uh, those are actually today, May 6th, at Max Bend in Missicoy Wildlife Refuge at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and tomorrow, May 7th, at Dead Creek WMA in Panton, Vermont, uh, at 6.30 p.m. Pre-registration is required through uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife's website with s- some limited availability. Um, I don't know if they are full up yet or not, but you could always check. Uh, equipment will be provided for these, but any participants are encouraged to bring their own rods, uh, flashlights, and headlamps. Uh, and then there will also be an introduction to fishing program on May 25th at the Intervale Center in Burlington from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, this also requires pre-registration, and the program will cover uh, aquatic ecology, fisheries management, regulations, equipment, and of course, some hands-on fishing opportunities. Um, so a couple great opportunities there in New England uh, to get some new people out and learning how to fish. So let's stick right here in New England, and this time in Maine, where a bill has been introduced to allow limited Sunday hunting. Um, we've been seeing a lot of attempts throughout New England through the last, I don't know, seven to 10 years to try to get this expanded. Um, this bill would allow private landowners to hunt their land and to give written permission to others to hunt it as well. The bill has had a lot of support from hunters, uh, but unfortunately not from the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, who opposed the bill, stating that some landowners have made it clear that they do not want Sunday hunting and don't want to be portrayed as the bad guy uh, that would not give permission uh, to other people. Uh, And also that game wardens would be burdened uh, with enforcing the proposal. However, the department did say it understands that Sunday hunting could provide potential economic growth and additional opportunity for hunters. And at the same time, they recognize that many landowners prefer to have Sunday uh, as a day when they can enjoy their land. Honestly, that doesn't sound like an agency that's supporting hunting and fishing. Um, I really haven't seen anything like that before here in New England. Um, It's a little disheartening. So any of those who hunt Maine, uh, contact your legislators and push for this Sunday hunting. Um, It is an economic driver. So uh, use that to our advantage and see if they can make it happen. So on to Mass, where uh, Senator Michael Moore has proposed Bill S-997 uh, at the request of the Gun Owners Action League, uh, which would stiffen, stiffen the 25-year-old uh, hunter harassment penalties in the state. Moore was swayed by a Wareham uh, hunter's story of falling 25 feet uh, and injuring his back after his stand was sabotaged and the cables have been cut. Uh, current mass law prohibits harassment of someone who is illegally hunting. Um, the punishment for hunter harassment in the state is a fine of up to $500 or 14 days in jail. But according to a retired environmental police officer, uh, disrupting a hunt usually resulted in a $50 ticket for a first time offense. Uh, more serious offenses like slashing tires can result in criminal charges. But uh, Senator Moore's bill would make vandalism of hunting equipment a criminal charge, punishable by up to two years in prison and a $5,000 fine. And vandalism uh, resulting in bodily injury could be punished, uh, punishable by up to five years in jail and a $10,000 fine. My opinion, it's still not enough for of a, ter- of a deterrent. Um, nor is it a heavy enough punishment for what might be considered as attempted murder. Um, but it is a step in the right direction. So, again, contact your legislators in mass um, and try to get this stuff passed because all it's going to do is help protect us uh, hunters from harassment out there in the field. So, with that, as always, uh, please feel free to send along any news you have to me, especially if it's anything like those fishing programs or any hunting programs. Uh, or anything like that that are geared towards, you know, getting new people in the outdoors. Um, Always warrant that kind of information to get out to people and get more people involved. So you can hit me up on Facebook at Mike Salter or on Instagram at bearded underscore bohunter21. And with that, enjoy the rest of your ride. All right. There's your news for your cruise. We'll keep that. Well, I guess we can keep Mike around. What do you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got a solid, solid place.
So, all right. So we'll keep him around. Thanks, someone's Mike. Gotta, Appreciate you. Someone's got to keep us educated on what's going on. Yeah, we know that we're not highly educated at all. So right. we'll let them keep doing what they're doing. But, well, speaking of getting educated, man, um, by this time, I will be in the north woods of Maine Shed Hon, dude. Pretty excited for that. That'll yeah, be it's cool going to be a fun trip. trip, dude. So when we do get back, we'll do a little bit of review on that and kind of go over how that went. And then, yeah. Can't wait to see uh, Ruby try to carry a paddle. So that was kind of one of the things that we've been talking about here. So some dogs do do that and they do carry the paddles. Some of them go to them, lay down. Some of them go to them and bark. So I don't know what she's going to end up doing. I haven't actually trained her with an actual paddle. Um, I've only trained her with pieces of um, moose antlers. I do have one that's been outside for a while and is ready to go out, but I've just been slacking. Um, between traveling and everything, going down and seeing you and then coming back and getting ready for turkey season, I have been slacking and haven't put it out. So we'll see what she does. It is what it is, and we'll go up and have fun, man. Like I said, man, even if that dog just walks around with me and just my companion of – and she doesn't find a shed, I could care less, honestly. So just cool to have her with it's me. It's all a good time, man. All yeah. Time. You know the great thing about going to the great state of Maine, right? No. Mark, I get to go see Mark. Okay. Good to hang out with Mark. I'm going to go he, see Mark first. Did he twist your arm into getting a turkey tag? Well, so we I was going to anyways. <laughs> um, normally, their season opens on May 1st. Well, this year, that Saturday, May 1st, is Junior Hunt Day. So gotcha. by the time that we're up there, it'll be Junior Hunt Day. They don't open until the 3rd. By the 3rd, I'll already be in the North Woods. So I won't be able to turkey hunt. was kind of thinking about stopping back on the way home but i know how this works being nine days off off grid and so on and so forth and hiking and all that it just it never works out this is every time i go up there i say to mark i'm gonna come and visit you on the way home never happens so i just i'm not gonna get my hopes up i'm just gonna rush home and then hunt out the rest of the season i'm already missing eight days so right right in the middle of the peak don't even talk about it (laughs) just gotta remind you Yep. So it wasn't my choice. I'm just going to let you know that. <laughs> it's all good, brother. Yep. So, well, man, why don't we get Tyler on from uh, Scaled Up Guide Service in uh, Michigan? Yeah. And uh, let's let's do some, some freshwater stuff for a change. Yeah, something a little different. All right. Well, uh, stand by your reels. Here we go. Shooter, shooter, big buck. Stack, stack, stack. Get the gas. All right, we're back on the phone with Tyler from Scaled Up Sport Fishing, man. What's going on? Oh, nothing. Just enjoying a 80-degree day here in Michigan. It doesn't <laughs> happen that often in April. So. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that, man. Nothing wrong with that at all. Why don't you? Uh, why don't we turn this key, man? Well, we'll get this thing right underway. I know there's a lot of good stuff coming. So why don't you tell everyone who you are, where you're from, and what you do? All right, yeah, I'm uh, Tyler Kalamiski, own Scaled Up Sport Fishing. Uh, basically we target, uh, all the freshwater species that you can think of here in Michigan. Um, mostly focusing in on walleyes. Uh, every once in a while we get into some salmon and everything like that, but, um, it's a little bit more with, uh, some, some things to come down the road in the coming years that we'll be, uh, focusing more on that. Um, we, uh, are a freshwater guide service that, um, love what I do. And the only reason I'm doing it is because I love it. So there's a thousand jobs out there right now. And yeah. uh, when you can do this uh, and love it, it pays well. What kind of made you, what kind of made you go into the guide service? Kind of oh, doing man. that kind of way. You're diving into a deep hole. <laughs> so <laughs> at first, so basic, basically, basically uh, 
I mean, my whole life, I either said I was going to grow up to be a conservation officer or a guide. And uh, I, uh, up to August, was in a different career path. I uh, actually was a state cop here for five years. Oh, wow. And uh, with everything, you know, going on in the world, um, it seemed like a good opportunity to kind of cut some ties and chase some dreams, you know, and, yep. uh, and go full time with the fishing and, uh, and, you know, you fish every day anyway. So why not, why not, uh, take other people out and make a little bit of money doing it? Man, so. there's, there's nothing wrong with that, especially in the world today. Obviously, like you said, man, that, that can't be a, can't be an easy thing, man. I appreciate you doing that, that service. No, I appreciate it, man. And, and, you know, it's, uh, shout out to the men and women in blue they're out there uh keeping us safe and everything like that you know and uh i was just uh fortunate enough to have an early retirement 20 years early so that's awesome you can't beat that no you can't <laughs> at all especially you know and, and you know not a lot of people go go out of their element and, and kind of chase that dream i mean i know it's i personally have done it but it's not an easy step you know going into doing that i mean it's you have to give up a lot to be able to do those things oh it's crazy like everybody just sees you know the the posts about fishing or or you know sees the t-shirts or you know sees the logo and and they don't realize the amount of sacrifice that goes into it you know you go from a guaranteed paycheck with a w-2 and a 401k to uh making a living hoping that the fish will bite it's a whole different game yeah, especially that, or the wind blows too hard and keeps you in, and you're just not making money. You got to move things out, or so on yeah. and so forth, man. You know, or yep. or the customers well, just aren't there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you it, you know, you look at it like life's pretty short. You know, um, I I had uh, lost a dear friend right around the same time that uh, that I left the uh, the state police, and you know, it kind of made me realize it was an overnight freak freak experience and and he was my fishing partner so he's actually he's actually the one that helped name the company and everything like that um because i kind of knew that was the direction i was going and then it was kind of like hey you know what tomorrow ain't promise so let's go do some real cool stuff today oh yeah well said so. there's a lot of truth to that man because i think a lot of people my me myself i was the same exact way you know i was like what are you, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to chase that nine to five every single day, or are you going to, you're going to go out and chase those dreams and be able to do what you want every single day. I mean, I know it's a grind and it's a lot of work, but it is what it is, man. Like it's, you got to enjoy it. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So it's definitely yep. freaking awesome. The pay, so, man, the pay definitely, the pay definitely ain't just in the check. No, no, no. I think it's, I, I think there's a lot that comes, comes with it. Like, I bet you that you could agree to it. Like when you have that person on the boat and they catch that first big fish or, or they learn that next thing. I mean, you're, you're really, you're, you're teaching someone to do something for the rest of their life, honestly. Yeah, no, especially even to see, you know, I, I always ask people and tell people, Hey, you know, is this your first walleye? Is this your first walleye jigging? Blah, blah, blah. I get a lot of, a lot of straight up first timers that are, this is their first walleye ever. And, you know, I'm just as nervous netting that fish as I am the 10, 10, 11 pounder in, in Lake Erie. Cause I don't <laughs> want to knock off their first walleye, man. Like <laughs> that's definitely not scaled up. <laughs> Absolutely. I hear that. Oh, I couldn't so. imagine. There's a lot of tension that goes behind it. People don't understand that. Even if it is not even that, you know, like that big fish, man, I I've had a point where, you know, when I was on one of the big party boats and we used to do a lot of ground fishing for fluke and stuff and you go to go net a fish or gaff a fish and you miss and knock it off. I mean, there's a lot of tension in a boat and it could change your paycheck too. Oh yeah. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to, I, I say this to everybody. The net man is the most thankless position because the guy who caught it's the one that gets all the credit. And if you knock it off, then you get all the heat. So ain't there ain't no love for the net man. No. <laughs> Truth to that, man. So why don't you go into a little bit of, of what you do while I fish in, man? Some of the, the, the techniques and stuff, because I know like jigging and I don't know if you troll for them or whatever the case may be, but what's kind of like your go-to on the, and you know, in yeah, different no. times of season? No, absolutely. And and up here, you know, in Michigan, we've got we're lucky to have the Detroit River, St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, Saginaw Bay, Lake Erie. I mean, you're talking, and and I'm just naming the the big guys, you know. Um, 
it, we're lucky enough to have such an incredible fishery, you know, that, that it, uh, offers many, many opportunities to catch fish. So I focus mainly on trolling and jigging. You know, I go back and forth. What'll be my favorite. Uh, I like feeling them hit, which is jigging, you know, it's more of a one-on-one experience but trolling is such an effective tactic and there's so many intricacies that people don't realize you know especially uh to be productive every single day you know you can't just go to your secret spot because those things those things just don't exist man the water changes every day and uh especially when you start looking at the trolling game i mean you're looking at using the water as your structure rather than you know they do relate to the bottom and everything like that but they're relating to water clarity. They're relating to water temperatures. And that's held very true this year in the Detroit River because um, we've been stuck with some clear water on the American side of the river. And uh, the Canadian side has been holding, with the predominant west winds, a lot of our dirtier, warmer waters. And that's holding a lot of our walleyes over there this year. So, um, I mean... Between between the two, I couldn't tell you whether I like jigging or trolling better because I love them both. Right. But that's our main focus is up here. So so when you were saying with the dirty water, you want to be fishing in the dirty water or you want to be fishing in the clean water? You want to be fishing on the break of the those two? Well, okay. So uh, this is this is if I could hammer anything home to, to anybody, even first day walleye fishing, that'll just put you leaps and bounds ahead of the learning curve is that walleyes are low light feeders. So everybody thinks that that means dawn, dusk, dark, you know, but that ain't, that ain't the case because a dirty water pattern will reduce the light enough for a walleye to have optimal feeding conditions. So it could be sunny and 75, but it's, you know, muddy water and that's, that's producing a low light condition that simulates darkness or or dawn or dusk and that'll cause them walleyes to feed as if it was a nighttime bite the other thing that simulates that and why we fish a lot of deep water up here and the river systems jigging is is just that the deep water the further you go away from the surface the more and more light disappears so you can keep a hot bite going through the middle of the day and and have people pretty happy to not be out there at midnight catching fish because you're in deep or dirty water so anybody that says i mean there is definitely a point in time when it's too dirty but early spring especially in lake erie i'm fishing the dirt the dirty dirty water and and i'm talking we'll catch you know double digit pound fish you know 10 11 pounders and those fish almost religiously come and shallow dirty water and i'll catch them in the middle of the day and the upper half of the column which and this- to to most walleye fishermen they'll say well you got to catch them on bottom or you got to have it where they can see it well they got two purposes in life they're either feeding or they're spawning and they're professionals at both so they know how to catch whatever they need to to keep themselves full and the, they're going to do it in that dirty water so are you looking for some type of break in the water when you're doing it? Like, as far as like, yeah. what are you looking for in the water? So yeah, they, a lot they of, in like the non, the not like the, the, lev, the lee side of it or. So a lot of times, yeah, you are looking for, for those breaks in the water. Um, trolling in and out of mud lines is great. Um, just recently, even just to relate it back to jigging. Uh, there was a section of the Detroit river where, I mean, most of the Detroit river in April, you can basically walk across the boats. So, you know, just because it's such a popular fishery, but it's been really tough this year. And, uh, I was able to locate some dirty water, um, and, and warmer water where I would be driving on the river and watching my graph and jump up from like 42 to 45 degrees and, and, you know, like that. And at that point is where you're starting to see, you know, these more cooperative fish. And, uh, and so, yes, the breaks definitely help, but you need to, you need to, 
you realize that the water is the structure in a lot of these, you know, springtime or deep water situations. You're not casting a tree limb trying to pull a large mouth off of it. You know, you're, you're, you're fishing 40, 50 feet of water sometimes when you're jigging. You know, trolling, you can be as shallow as eight feet or less. Um, and a lot of times it is those subtle breaks that you'll see a good pair of polarized sunglasses is all you need to see them. And as soon as that sun starts popping out, you'll see the stages of dirty, dirty and dirtier water all the way out to the clean water. And you'll find where them fish are the most active and, and really go uh, farming for them at that point. So. so how are you deciding on like if you're jigging or you're trolling, like, and you were saying that you were getting them higher in the water columns. Like, how do you go about doing such a thing? Like, are you fishing a different type of lure or? Yeah. Yeah. So when we're jigging, uh, basically, uh, I, I guess I'll tread lightly on this, but when we're jigging, we, uh, are using like a, for customers, I'll use like a one ounce jig to help, help them find bottom. Okay. Um, and, uh, and what we're doing at that time is basically just focusing on jigging when I've got jigging trips. Um, the later in the year you get, you know, we, we'll start pulling bottom bouncers with crawler harnesses and that type of thing in the same time period that we're jigging. I mean, it, it, it just kind of depends on the day and the skill set of the clients. But when you're talking trolling specific, like we're actually out trolling, that's, that's when we're going to be targeting that, you know, shallower section of water um, and pulling anywhere from crawler harnesses to body baits. Um, bandits are a very popular lure out here, um, and they are very effective. Uh, I mean, it's no secret that walleyes eat bandits, and uh, that's the reason that they can charge like 14 bucks a piece for them for custom ones. So. Wow. What, what exactly is a bandit for us that don't know? I actually got one right here. Um, so basically, it's just a deep diving crankbait. Oh, okay. Um, you can get these unassisted, I think, up to about 23, 24 feet. Wow. Um, with, I mean, you're talking at that point, 100, uh, you know, 100 plus feet of line back. But, um, you know, assisted, they'll go, uh, they'll go any depth with a snap weight. But mostly we're running those uh, unassisted behind planter boards when I'm fishing Lake Erie early in the season, Lake St. Clair, um, Saginaw Bay, that type of thing. I don't spend too much time up on Saginaw Bay just because uh, the the rest of the Great Lakes kind of consume my time. But um, they are a staple. You know, you've got bandits, you got uh, P-10s by Smithwick, you got deep diving husky jerks by your Paula. I mean, they all have their day in the sun. Um, but I do tend to see that bandits stand out. Um, especially on certain days, you know, where nothing else will, nothing else will go. And, and we're running a straight up, you know, eight or 10 rod spread and every single, every single one's a bandit, a different color variation. Sounds like tuna fishing, eight to 10 rods. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <laughs> that's, some guys are gonna laugh because they run more than that so wow that's crazy i mean that's that's yeah. like being in the canyons pulling 14 16 rods at one time trolling yeah are you guys running like outriggers and stuff like that obviously oh, for them or something mm -hmm. like that yep, yeah absolutely and then you have flat lines off the back of the boat but i mean we got a lot more boat to play with when we're doing something like that i mean you're talking <laughs> some boats are fuck What's a, what's a wide boat? 20 like feet? A 10 foot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 20, 20 feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least a 10 foot beam on it. 10, 12 foot beam on it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then you start sure. putting outriggers on it and stuff. So I couldn't imagine running that many rods on, on, you know, what we would call a skiff boat, you know? Yeah. I mean, for us, like right now I'm running a uh, eight foot beam on my boat. Uh, it's 21 feet long center council in all honesty, uh, I'm I'm si I'm gonna start moving out of this boat into a little bit bigger boat, um, just just to help grow the business even more and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But we achieve we we're able to run these types of spreads because of using inline planer boards. Okay. And 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 those uh, 
as soon as somebody can learn how to run inline boards and not get everything tangled up, they they've uh, they've kind of mastered, you know, a lot of the the walleye fishery up here. Mm-hmm. So, so like, are you obviously you do a lot of trolling in the lakes? You do you don't do much trolling inside the rivers or? Yeah, it's a different style. So in in, in the river systems, uh, you've it, there's so many ways to catch walleyes up here. It's it's unreal. I focus on jigging and trolling, and when we're trolling in the river, we're mostly pulling bottom bouncers with crawler harnesses on them. So at that time, I'm running like a six six rod spread. It's something that I really tailor to people that have trouble grasping the concept of ver- vertical jigging, um, or like younger kids or something like that. A lot of a lot of times, I mean, you're not catching a ton of trophy fish doing that in the river systems, but you're probably catching a lot of fish, a lot of smaller, you know, uh, smaller males, um, maybe maybe some immature females and stuff like that. But so many of the times when we're searching for big fish, uh, they've either already spawned and dropped back to the lakes, or uh, they're out of the river system, but no, we, we do troll the river system Mm -hmm. and it can be very, very productive. Um, it's just a whole nother animal, you know, uh, but it's, it is a very, very good way of catching fish. So when, at what temperature do you start to fish in the rivers when they're going up into spawn? So, I mean, you can start, honestly, you can catch walleyes. I don't care what anybody says in the Detroit or St. Clair River 365 days a year. When we really start fishing for them, I would say is right around that 38 to 40 degree temperature. I mean, you're looking at pre-spawn fish at that time. Uh, You start to see a lot of them lose their eggs at about 42. Um, I was actually pre-fishing before any of our client trips this year with my old man. And I, I, like I want to say term, it was free fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. Exactly. 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 You can't just show up and expect them to jump in the boat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so pre fishing with my old man, um, it was the last week of March might've been like the 26th or 27th. And we, uh, we had like, I think we caught about 15 fish that day and 12 of them were pre spawn females. I mean, six seven pound fish i think the biggest was about eight and then after that it tapered right off because the water temp shot up and once they drop their eggs they're gone they, they don't get them eggs back even if it drops back to 42 40 degrees you know them fish are post spawn at that point and they've moved on to greener pastures so um we'll fish that either the detroit or st Clair river you know all the way up into july for uh for you're not getting trophy fish at those times but um the once the water temps start getting up we start moving away from that jigging bite more towards that crawler harness bite and then you start to drop down back more towards the the lake yeah we drop back more towards the lake uh a lot of times in the river systems you'll be fishing that deeper water that i talked about where Mm -hmm. you're getting those you know it's 10 a.m and you're fishing you know 30 or 40 feet of water and and it's stimulating low light for them um, down there. So they're still actively feeding. But, I mean, in the early mornings, you know, I got buddies that are big into casting, and, and they'll smash them, smash fish, casting first thing in the mornings um, and then in what shallow they, water. Then they, then they so, so they're, they're just like any other t- type of predatorial fish where they move up into the shallows during the morning or the night. And then they move yep. back to the deeper water. So you're saying by 10 o'clock, now they're dropping themselves back to the deeper water and start fishing in the deeper water. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's funny. Um, I'll see you guys make a couple major mistakes in, in jigging or trolling. They'll, they'll, they'll smash them on their first drift. They'll smash them on their first troll pass. You know, maybe it's too windy where you can't turn around or whatever. And they'll just keep beating that line, beating that line. And, and they'll, they'll keep drifting that same contour and then they'll say, Oh, well the fish shut off. Well, no stupid. They move somewhere. They didn't just shut off. Like they, they're, <laughs> they're an opportunistic feeder. Like they are going to go and feed and they have two jobs as far as we know, feed and spawn. So mm-hmm. maybe, maybe rather than making that same drift, you just move out five, 
you know, five feet in depth, or you look on your, you look on your sonar and you find where, you know, the spillway or the trough of the, of, of the channel is, and you move into that deeper water and, and start, okay, well now we're putting a pattern together here. You know, um, when you're trolling or you're jigging in a river system, you're always leaving fish behind you. I can't stress that enough. They say never leave fish to find fish. Well, when you are drifting, you're literally drifting at any, you know, anywhere between two to five miles an hour, depending on the wind. You're literally leaving fish behind you. So if you go through a hot bite, get back right up on them, get back right up on them and then start to move your way down the shelf. If they, if they start to turn off, them fish are still there. They've just, they're just going to move. Right. Exactly. And it, do you find yourself fishing in more shallow water pre-spawn oh, or yeah. spawn? Okay. Oh yeah. So, so pre-spawn, pre-spawn and spawn. I'll, I'll tell anybody this. If I can catch a walleye in a puddle, I'm catching them in a puddle. I don't necessarily like fishing 40 or 50 feet of water, but that, that pre-spawn shallow bite and man, oh man, like people don't think walleyes fight, you know, they're just kind of a, you know, lazy, lazy fish or whatever, but you hook a walleye in like eight feet of water and you're jigging for them. They're there. And when they get up to the boat, they're not very happy. And then they're right back to the bottom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're, lo- we're using light gear, you know, we're using these, you know, six foot anywhere between a five, six and a six, six, uh, medium heavy rod with an extra fast tip and eight pound braided line with like an eight pound leader. I mean, we're not using heavy gear to winch these things up, so you still got to fight them. And and a lot of times they're throwing the hook, you know. There's nothing I like seeing more when you hook the fish. And and with the hook set, you can already see the fish in the water with its mouth wide open just shaking down there. I mean, so, yeah, it's pre-spawn, shallow water, lights out. But I'll tell everybody this, and and let me say this before we move on. If If you're listening to this and you're fishing shallow water, do not drive back over the fish. Do not drive over them. You shut them down. Drive around them. Maybe go to the deep water where they're not at and drive up. We don't like playing those games, but I mean, you see it every day. Guys mm-hmm. playing out over them and they shut them down quick. So and then they move and they scatter right out. It's the same in the salt, man. They they, they just don't want motors over them. It's, it's just they don't, especially shallow water. If a helicopter was flying over me, I'd probably run that way. <laughs> exactly. In, the, in those areas, are you looking for like rocky areas, small pebble areas, sandy areas? So there's a lot. A lot of it is to do with, yes, rock structure. I mean, it depends on, it dep- really depends on where you're fishing. Down mm-hmm. in the Detroit River, you're looking you're looking at completely different rock structures, especially in the lower river. Um, you know, you have your ter- traditional spots that everybody knows about and, and you're fishing s- sand shelves adjacent to rock structure and everything like that. But when you're looking at a river and you're driving up and down it, especially up here, seawall is everywhere. There's seawall all over the place, which is probably, I don't know, the sin of man for fresh water up here is seawall because it's just completely changed the structure of our lakes. So if you're driving along a river system and you see something that is not seawall, it's rock or it's a beach or something like that, that's going to create different structure in that water. And that little subtle difference that, you know, if you got a hundred miles of just plain ass road and then you come up to an area that, you know, it, it is slightly different just in human terms. You know, there's, there's going to be something different there. You'll, you'll just know it's the same to a fish. They're going swimming up a river, swimming up a river. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get to uh, an area that's, that's slightly different because of the shore structure. You're going to get back currents, you're going to get different bottom structure and you're going to find fish. Those fish are going to hang up there. Yeah. And and then Absolutely. when you're going into those areas, you're going into those areas like jigging and so on and so forth. What what's kind of like your style to jigging? Like, are you running plastics? Are you running bucktails? Are you running baits? Like, 
Yeah, we we are on uh, a very uh, there's about a million different variations of plastics, but most commonly up here you're looking at uh, finesse minnows, wine dot worms, um, paddle tails, especially earlier in the season. If I got any buddies listening to this, they're gonna laugh about it because uh, I preach paddle tails early in the season. They hate them, but um, it, it's it, it's to emulate a dying bait fish. And, and when I get a new customer out there that's never jigged before or anything like that, they think they've seen the videos of guys just ripping it, ripping it, ripping it. No, we're bouncing it down the river. We're just walking this dying bait fish down the river. That's all we're doing. So act like a dying bait fish. Chances are they're not ripping up at 40 miles an hour, you know, in fresh water, salt water. You guys whole different, whole different story. Well, we're doing the but, same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little bit higher speeds and everything. Yeah, exactly. But but no, in fresh water and in and, and, and the river systems, I tell people we can never jig slow enough, but we can always jig too fast. Because a lot of times you'll be jigging and you'll feel the line go slack and you've been jigging that same 35 feet and all of a sudden, you know, there's like a foot difference. Like the bottom probably did not come up right up there what's happened to you is that there's a fish freaking holding on to your bait. So right. set the hook, man. Right. You know, um, it, if, if I could enlighten anybody with anything, it's no slack in your line on jigging, always keep it tight and low and slow until they start getting more aggressive. Then you can get away with more mistakes. I mean, they're just trying to eat. So. And, and that's one thing I found with the wallet too, especially in the earlier season where they've, they've, they don't really like smash it. They just kind of like lay on it. They grab it and they lay yep. on it. So like when yep. you go to do that next jig, that's when you end up feeling the fish. You know, they're not aggressively like it's it's not like a it's not like a bass in the top water where they just absolutely no. destroy on it. They just they just kind of lay on it and they just sit there and then they hold and then you on your next jig yep. now you're just feeling that weight and that tension. Yep, and there's definitely times when we when we get them on fire bites where um, on our jigs we run a stinger hook, so we'll have the main hook. And then the stinger hook that leads back to basically the end of the finesse minnow or wind out worm, pick whatever plastic you want. And, and when their main hook smashing it, it's great. I mean, because anybody, I could probably hook them with a, holding it with my feet mm-hmm. at that point, you know, but, but when they're, when they're that real finesse bite, a lot of times they'll just track it to the bottom and you'll feel them as you're lifting up or they're hitting it at the top and you're, and you're losing that tension. That's why keeping keeping that slack out of your line is so important because because as soon as something's a little bit different they're going to let it go before you know it they they know i mean they've ate i don't know how many thousands of bait fish to get to just to be an 18 inch walleye you know so they know when something's different and you're putting a piece of lead with a piece of plastic in their mouth and when it's cold a piece of minnow on top of a piece of plastic hooked onto a piece of lead they're going to spit it quick so and you're yeah, always no, using stingers, always use stingers. You know, some guys hate it. I always use it because why not? I, right. I don't see, I don't hook the stinger into the plastic. It kind of just free floats back there. I tie my own stingers to the length that I want. And I've, I can honestly say that they've never caught me less fish. Valid point. <laughs> yeah. Very just, valid point. Yeah. I've never used them. So like I that's why I'm asking, man. Like I, I I'm I've, picking I've used them down here on the Shenandoah a little bit for smallmouth when they're when you get a lot of those that are just hitting the tails, but they won't take a yep. full commit, that's where they come in handy because you know, they'll swipe at that tail and try to suck them in and they'll catch the stinger. Oh yeah. No, and absolutely. I mean when when you're talking about uh a traditional stinger bite, you're talking about cold fronts, talking about clean water. Maybe you're stuck like we are on the American side right now where we have to be fishing the clean water because <laughs> there's not that much dirty water over here. What do you mean? You right can't now. go to Canada right now? We can't go to Canada right now. No. Oh, let COVID, me guess. It's COVID got the vid. <laughs> it's got the vid, yeah. We would hate we would hate to bring the demon virus over there. So, uh, <laughs> so but yeah, no, I mean, so you're talking, you know, those stinger bites are cold or clean, cold water, clean water. Um, they're, they're basically essential. I don't know why guys don't use them. Um, and then uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It, it does not affect the action of the bait whatsoever. 
because it's just free floating back there. They lay straight. Uh, the way that I tie my stingers is they, they, I've got a leader sleeve with a little loop that sticks out the end of it. And when you pull it tight, it just cinches right down to the main hook and it runs behind it. And, and I mean, there's no way that it can affect anything other than improving your quality of fishing. So is there, is there some type of color that you like over another color? Mm. Man, it depends on the day. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's a trick question. That's loaded. It, it really depends on the day. I mean, we call up here, we call uh, one color, we call it OG, like original gangster. The OG of the OG up here is an antifreeze jig head with a glow belly Arkansas shiner. I mean, it's just a very natural presentation to the bait fish that we have up here. Um Trolling, you know, it, it's a whole different ball game. Honestly, when I, if I have, if I'm trolling or jigging, if I have four people on the boat jigging, we start the day out with my four favorite colors. And then we start switching everything up and I end up with pockets full of plastics and everything like that. But we start out with those four colors because if everybody started out with my favorite color every single day, there's definitely days that, that, that it doesn't work. It works 50% of the days. So the other 50%, are you just going to smash your head off the wall or, you know, you're going to find out what they like. So what's the four colors you start with? Um, Trade it'd be, secret, uh, guys. okay. It'd be uh antifreeze jig head with an Arkansas shiner. Number one, antifreeze jig head with a, Blue ice, uh, blue ice finesse minnow would probably be number two. Um, this year, I would say uh, antifreeze jig head. You're gonna see a common theme here. Antifreeze, or we call it Mackie green up here. It's a real, it's a real light, bright green. Um, jig head with a black wine dot worm. Okay. Or maybe a black wind out worm with Starcher's tail. And then number four, I'm going to have to go like a purple jig head. And there's this color called Motor City Madness. Yep. It's like a, a blue flake with like a purple hue to it and everything like that. Purple, can, man, there was this one year I fished with the same purple jig head all year. I didn't break it off. Zero snags, like probably 50 days on the water to the point it had no paint on it. And I ran that combo. I didn't even tie on the OG. I didn't even tie on antifreeze. Everybody else keeps that. But that year they wanted purple and purple has to stay in the sun. It's the last, it's one of the last colors to disappear at depth. So anytime you're fishing deep water, purple or black is always a good bet. That makes so much more sense. I was trying to get it out of you because I was, we, we've come to learn here that purple is the color. Like we just yeah. <laughs> we do well with purple. And I was wondering yep. if it transpired over there. We had some friends in Ohio that we had talked to about uh, walleye fishing there. And he was the same way, purple, purple, purple. And then the guys that I fish with here, uh, Mike and Carl, they, they both use purple, purple, purple. So I was trying to see if it transpired over there. And then it just made sense why, why purple always works. Yep. Staples, staples, purple and antifreeze. Seriously. And, and, and just real quick on, on that, you know, you said, you know, you go across the country or, or you got buddies, buddies in different lakes or whatever. Um, me and my buddies had an opportunity this year in the wintertime um, <laughs> with Canada being closed. We normally go to Lake Simcoe and go perch fishing. Well, this year we drove out to Devil's Lake, North Dakota, and we went perch and walleye fishing. And, and the number one thing with any destination fishing that I can tell people is a walleye is a walleye is a walleye. Perch is a perch is a perch. Muskie is a muskie is a muskie. You, they will eat the same things here that they will there. So go there and buy that novelty equipment, but don't forget about your tried and true home tactic. Because when we were out there, we were able to, through the ice, I mean, catch unlimited amounts of fish, basically. Obviously, we kept our limit, you know, but it was fish after fish after fish and we experimented using their tactics and we experimented with what we were comfortable with and what we were comfortable with we were more productive with so no matter what 
A walleye is a walleye is a walleye. And they're going to freaking eat. So use what you're comfortable with. So with that destination fishing, like what is, I, I kind of, now that you kind of bring it up, I kind of want to ask some questions about it because like, what did you do to set up to do such a thing? Like going there, did you talk to locals? Did you like e-scout? Like what kind of <laughs> things did you do to try and to kind of figure out what you had going on? So we, uh, I do some snow plowing in the wintertime and everything. So my schedule is a little bit out there but luckily my two buddies that i went with were pretty flexible and everything like that so it was like a monday we were having some beers and stuff like that and i was like hey dude let's go to devil's lake tomorrow because it's not gonna snow and they were like all right let's see what we can do and uh you know what next day tuesday we headed out for five days because there was no snow in the forecast luckily and uh by the time we got out there you know we had done some searching on Navionics and everything like that. Picked the mind of some bait shops. Uh, bait shops were actually pretty helpful out there, which, you know, some some areas of the country, you get a lot of help. Some areas you don't. And uh, got out there to these areas that um, they had kind of enlightened us with and uh, did some searching around and were able to find fish. And then we just started looking at the lake. Devil's Lake, I don't even know the number on it. Say it was like 50,000 acres uh, 10 years ago. It's something crazy, like 200,000 acres. Those numbers could be completely wrong, but it's literally like grown in four times its size. And it's very. it was a very intimidating thing to take on. But if you go to any body of water and, and, and you've become – good at your own body of water and looking for structure and looking for you know what fish relate to they don't change the water it's it's all water and they're all swimming in it and they're gonna do the same thing in every lake they're you know their target their target forage base might be a little bit different but overall how they relate to structure and everything like that they're just fish man and and were you out there you were trying to catch walleye or you were perch fishing or both both yeah are you finding yep. that you're finding those area those they they're living in the same similar areas or do you yeah so i mean out there the one thing with the perch that was a little different than what we're used to um when we fish lake simcoe and everything up in canada you know you can end up in some deeper water but out there i think we found our major perch schools in like 35 feet and um you know they just kind of uh bed like crazy and were you looking for some type of structure when you were fishing them or weed beds or whatever so we related it out there uh like i said the bait traps kind of pointed us in the right direction but we had to do some searching so we actually went an entire day without catching we got there we smashed the walleyes and then we said you know what we're really out here for these jumbo perch you know we want these 12 13 inch you know pigs and we had it out and uh we went an entire day without catching a bird, beating our heads off the wall. We just kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. And, you know, they, Devil's Lake allegedly can be really treacherous, and I'm sure it is at times with a lot of snow, a lot of wind, everything like that. We just had perfect weather, and we, we were able to use our quads, and we never even, uh, we never even stopped uh, with, uh, you know, with shanties or anything like that, just fishing off the side of the quad. So like you would on the big lakes. Oh yeah. Yep. And, and just flying around, you know, if it, especially with ice fishing, man, if, if a bite shuts down, you can literally drill before I even start fishing, I'll drill like 10 holes and okay, we're on fish. All right. They shut down. I'll move like 10 feet to the next hole that I drilled. And you'll be back on a hot bite. That's if crazy. you think about it, like when you're casting for perch or casting or any other type of fishing, you're literally, I'd, I'd pay good money to see somebody that could cast into the same exact hole every time, you know? So just think about when you're ice fishing as like a casting, you know, method, you're, you're drilling your holes to cast out. And as soon as they're done in one, move to the next one. They didn't go far easy enough so every time we get a, a a fishing expert on here 
there always tends to be some very interesting stories in the the time guiding. What's some of the craziest things or most memorable things you've come across? All right. Well, most recently, uh, so I, obviously you know that we're in we're in a spawning period right now um, up here or post spawn, and a lot of a lot of Wait, the time you were here, you were the fish. <laughs> The fish, the okay. fish, the fish. Just, the fish. just clarifying. The, the, the wall, the wall I spawn. Yeah, my season, my season doesn't hit for another couple months at least. <laughs> but, warm weather. No. Yeah, exactly. Warm weather. Yep. So they call um, it hot girl no, summer. It, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to shed. I'll have to shed some. So, but yeah, no. So um, we're fishing uh, about two weeks ago, and I had a great group of guys. Uh, the fishing was tough. And, and they hung in there and, and we got, we got some fish, but not exactly what I like to put people on, you know? Um, and every dog has his day in the sun. So we, uh, we're fishing and catch a, you know, catch a fish and, and it starts getting some white stuff coming out of it. So I, I look at the one guy and I'm like, Hey, I could, I, you know, I could tell that I could probably get him with, with a pretty good joke. I'm like, mm-hmm. Hey man, that, that, that white stuff there, do you, I'm like, you know, you know what that is, right? And he's like, what is it? I'm like, well, you know, walleyes nurse their young to the age of three years old. I'm like, it's milk. It's high, it's high quality. He said it's high quality milk. You can, you can taste it if you want. So he, he, he puts his fingers in it. I'm like, watching him. I'm like, dude, I, I said it, it out loud. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, dude, if it was one of my buddies, I'd let him go all the way. But that ain't milk. It's a boy. And he's like, Oh my God, the look on his face and his buddies gave him endless, 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 endless shit. After that. I mean, endless. So uh, yeah. Walleyes, walleyes, just like any other species of fish do not nurse their young. So three. <laughs> they abandon them in the shallows and they return to deeper pastures. So, but that's funny <laughs> yeah yeah i like to have fun on my trips you know man uh it's a lot of joking around when i get guys that are very rarely do get guys that are grumpy or anything like that you know so i like giving people crap um i tell them they can give it back you know I'm not one of these grouchy old charter captains yet you know so i like having fun the day i the day i stop having fun then i guess i'll have to find a new hobby you know exactly it, so. The thing is that man, you're you're in the entertainment business. I say this to everybody, yeah. you know, like it's it's the entertainment business, and catching a fish is just a bonus. I mean, you're exactly. you're there. People are there on a vacation, have a good time, catch a ton of fish. That's that's what they're there for, you know. Or or just you know, just get out with the buddies and drink some beers, you know. Like we take it kind of serious because obviously we're all hardcore fishermen. So when you have yep. clients on the boat, you're like, oh, we got to catch fish, we got to catch fish. But a lot of people. I've come to realize over the past couple of years that people are just there to have a good time, man. Watch the sun come up or watch the sun set, hang out with their friends, BS and enjoy it, man, because they have normal crappy jobs that they have to go to nine to five. So they don't get to enjoy the things that we do every day. A hundred percent. They didn't, they, you know, you're not the dentist, you know, so don't, don't treat them like you're their dentist, you know, treat them like they are there to have fun. And That's- if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? You know, the best way, what is, to, the best way to become a millionaire in the fishing industry is to start out as a billionaire. So that's right. <laughs> that's very, <true>. very true. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had any type of like scary, like crazy times? Cause obviously I know like with the big lakes, things can kind of get kind of weird. Oh. And... You said too that many, a little man. too quick. <laughs> yeah. Too many, man. Uh, you know, a lot of times people don't realize even just on Lake St. Clair, you know, it's an, it's an angry lake. It's a big lake. You know, I grew up on not, I grew up fishing Lake St. Clair and, and I don't think I ever lived more than 10 miles from Lake St. Clair and, uh, was very fortunate for that. But we, you know, we had, we've had crazy times out there where you're all of a sudden into two three, four foot chop and, and they're, you know, spaced out a second and a half, two seconds, you know, I mean, I mean, two, three foot chop doesn't sound like a lot, but when them things are hitting you every, every second, you know, you're start, you're starting to get into some hairy times. They're not these, 
they're not these rollers. And like I said about the seawalls, it really keeps the energy of the wave in in the area. Even just recently, uh, we were out fishing. It was uh, the day before Easter. I had clients, and you know the the wind started blowing southwest. I will not put anybody in a dangerous situation. I told them, "Hey, we got we got to boogie out of here because it's going to get it's going to get nasty." And sure enough, wind wind in any river system blowing against the current. And this is important important thing to remember. Any wind that is blowing against the current in a river system will produce a dangerous chop. It will. And all of a sudden, we were in, you know, three, four-foot waves and taking her eight miles, eight, ten miles an hour to get back, you know, safe speed to get back. But that's all you could do, Jeez. you know. So then, I mean, you get into Lake Michigan stories, I mean – times with my buddies we've you know sometimes sometimes you earn and sometimes you learn and uh we've learned a lot out there so why what's some of the crazy things that have happened well Lake you michigan know, can kind of get kind of crazy ooh, man this, it, there's it's this got a time. bad reputation it does have a bad reputation a lot of boats on the bottom oh yeah yeah i mean the, the great lakes they're they're the freshwater ocean so i mean we uh, this oh, the one time I can remember it was like very early on into the boat that I currently have. I think it was actually the inaugural weekend. Like I had just got this boat. It was about five years ago. And, uh, we were fishing, uh, an area of Lake Michigan up towards the Northern end, um, out of a port called Frankfurt for King salmon, coho salmon steelhead it was, uh, had to be like the first weekend of September, probably five or six years ago. And, uh, we're in this bay and we had run up there with flat calm perfectly fine. And, and we run up to this bay that we're fishing in and we're smashing fish. Like nobody's, nobody's really paying attention because it's flat calm up in this bay. Well, we didn't realize that the South wind had kicked up to like 20 to 30 miles an hour. So we come around the corner to head back south and all of a sudden we're in like six, eight foot waves. So, so we're driving along and, and my boat can, be a wet ride in that type of and in, in that type of uh seas we're driving along and um coming off and coming down and just getting sprayed 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 bilge pumps around the whole time you know and uh we look back and this wild son of a bitch i don't know who this dude is but if he's out there listening he's on a kite board in this oh. 40 mile an hour south wind in like 100 feet of water jumping our wake wow. i'm not kidding you dude like straight up like shooting himself like 30 40 50 feet i don't even know how high into the air jumping in between our wake and the next like six eight foot wave it was the most wild that's wild, insane wild wild i've had dude. That, that's what you call confidence wow. <laughs> or stupidity or, take your that's pick. what i was just gonna say <laughs> stupidity you know yeah Everybody's got their own hobbies. He probably thought we were stupid for being out there too. So yeah. you know what? Well, he's going. You guys are trying to get home. Yes, I'm going to get a ride. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get home safe with a load of kings. He's just like out there, you know, catching goss. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is nuts. Nuts. I couldn't even imagine, bro. That's yep. insane. Yeah. No, it definitely. Uh, I mean. The rough weather, the, the weather, I, I tell everybody, if I could do away with one weather pattern, it would be wind, and I would take rain every day. If they just I, told me, it's going to rain every day that you're going to fish, but it will never blow over five miles an hour again, I would make that trade in a heartbeat. Yeah. I would, too. Yeah. It would have saved a lot of lives. <laughs> it would have saved a lot of lives <laughs> and a lot of back aches, man. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Well, man, I do have one last question for you, man, and that is what drives you outdoors? Uh, what drives me outdoors is just, you know, seeing the sun come up every day, seeing the smile on everybody's face when they're catching fish. And you know what? It'll drive me all the way to the end, man, until the day I'm gone. I mean, you know, you'll always chase uh, them limits, but it's not all about that. The day that the day that you start, you know, realizing that it ain't about that, you're going to become a more successful fisherman. 
and you're going to enjoy it a thousand times more. And that goes for duck hunting or anything too. Oh yeah. You know, once you appreciate it for what it is and not just reeling them in or shooting that big buck or, you know, putting a fat stack of green heads on a tailgate, those are all great things. But once you, once you realize that, that your days are numbered, so enjoy them all. You start living life the right way. Amen. Outstanding. I can't agree, can't agree anymore, man. Yeah. So that, and that, that's been a real big part here on the show lately is, uh, the adventure, the journey, the experience, you know, it's not so much that, you know, the bite or the shot, it's just nope. that everything that comes with just being out there doing it. Yep. You can't beat it. The, the bite or the shots, what gets you out there. And then all them other things is make what, it the reason that you're doing keeps it. You. Yep. Yep. Keep that's what keeps there. you going. Cause you I can't mean, have that bite or you can't have that shot every single day. So. Oh yeah, Absolutely. Yep. It's, well, it's not to be Instagram or Facebook famous or whatever the case may be. It's to really enjoy it, man. Especially <laughs> someone like yourself that's come from a, a pretty high intense job to yeah. now. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, like Steven's been to war. You, you know, you've been on the front lines, man. That's the outdoors is kind of one of those things that kind of like reels you back in and kind of makes you realize how much yeah, it actually. I like what you did there. <laughs> it reels you yep. back in. <laughs> yeah. No. I, and I tell everybody, I'd say this, you know, my, my worst day of fishing is better than my best day as a cop. So don't worry about me. I'm just fine. Yep. <laughs> Agreed. So. Well, Tyler, real quick, tell everybody where they can find you, how they can get a hold of you and uh, how they can come and support the business. Yep. Instagram at uh, scaled up sport fishing, Facebook scaled up sport fishing, our website scaled up sport fishing.com. Or you can call or text me at any time, 586-214-6293. Even if it's just, hey, man, I, you know, I, I use lamb and glass rods. How do you like them? Just simple questions. I love doing this. I can BS with anybody at any 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 day or time as long as I'm not busy or on fish um, about fishing it because I love it. So. Outstanding, man. Well, if we ever get up that way, we'll, uh, we'll definitely look you up and let you uh, show us a little bit about the northern waters yeah we'll have to trade one of them uh one of them salty trips for for a trophy eerie trip or something like that here down the road that actually works out i just happened to know a guy <laughs> yeah exactly 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 so all right perfect so well thank you again for your time and uh we'll definitely keep in touch i think there's a lot that we can do here in the future that'll get a little bit rowdy so absolutely man anytime i appreciate you guys you know, stay safe out there and, and enjoy it. So. You too, brother. And, uh, for everybody out there listening, look Tyler up, get on that, uh, that Northern water journey, go and enjoy, have some fun with it. Cause uh, it's, it's not our normal go-to on the show here, but I think it's something we're going to incorporate a lot more of, uh, might as well start early. And until then, we just want to thank you guys for tuning in, for checking everything out, and thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive. <laughs>